The happiest of happy Easter's to everybody. Lovely to see you. Welcome, welcome. Those at the back, why don't you come and join us? Bring your friends, bring your chocolate, bring your... Just grab somebody, basically, and bring them forward. See, the keen and eager ones, they got the best seats early. Lovely There's to see you. still some space welcome, at the welcome. front if you want to come right down to the front. Come on up, team. Happy Easter, everybody. Here we are, March the 31st, April the 1st tomorrow. Can you believe it? How fast is this year going? Too quick, exactly right. Come on in, guys. You are so welcome here. Uh, I'm Tim. It's a pleasure to lead alongside my friend Anna. Hello, everyone. Really, really big welcome this evening. Happy Easter. I hope you had a really wonderful day. Um, if you're new here, a particularly warm welcome. It's so great to see you. Um, we, if you are new, we would really love to get to know you. We would. We want you to be a part of this family. So just to flag a few ways that, that can, we can help facilitate that. Number one, speak to the person next to you. Um, and if you're a regular here, make sure you make extra effort to say hi to someone next to you. If you don't know who they are, if you're not introduced yourself before, do it, okay? That's your challenge. Yeah. But otherwise, there's some lovely faces at the back in pink. Lanyards, give us a wave. Welcome, team. They're not listening. <laughs> Nikki's there, there she is. Um, go and, uh, and chat, have a chat with one of those, um, one of the, anyone in a pink lanyard on your way out or this, during this evening. They can tell you all about what's happening in the life of this church and how you can get involved. Absolutely. And if it is your first time in the building, again, you are so, so welcome. And actually, I wish that you had been here all week. Uh, some of us regulars have been in and, in and around this week. Can I, do you mind if I just do a little experiment for the, for the family here, the Trinity family? Who came to something either on Tuesday or Wednesday Wednesday or Thursday or Friday this week. Just stick a mitt in the air. Yeah, have a look around. So that's, that's quite a lot of us. I'm really sad for those whose hands aren't up because you missed out on what has been a continuation, frankly, of a really rich year. I think that the Lord is really moving uh, among us. And uh, this last week has been amazing. Some incredible gatherings in here in particular. I hope it's been a great week for you. Clearly, there's the evidence of some things around us, wonderful artwork and creativity, and a huge thanks to all those who, who facilitate these things. But the Lord's really been, we, we've been meeting him in different kinds of ways through this week, uh, building Tuesday evening and Wednesday and Thursday, and, and then uh, five hours, Good Friday. But uh, such a sense of him in our midst and just 
grace and ease. And we're, we're just praying that there'll be a continuation tonight. This is, in, in one sense, Easter Sunday is a one-off. But in others, it's not, is it? It's just the continuation. Every, every day is a Resurrection Sunday because Jesus is alive. Amen. So, but we're excited for tonight and all God's going to do. So why don't you stand on that note? And um, had a wonderful gathering in here this morning with all kinds of ages. And um, the place was heaving. It was just great. So much life. We're praying the same tonight. And we're not very good at, at the formal liturgy stuff. You know that around here. We, we roll in a slightly different way. But there is, a, there is a traditional Easter shout. And I love the fact that this has been said in different languages for many, many years. So we're just going to say this two or three times. It goes something like this. You'll, you'll know the words and they'll be on the screen. I go, hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Again, hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. God, we love you so much. We are so excited to be here this evening and to worship you, to exalt you, to lift your name high, to, to be full of gratitude and awe as we think about all that this day represents, as we look at the cross in front of us, knowing that you overcame death, that you resurrected and that that power is very much we have access to that power today. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you that we get to sing, we get to dance, we get to move our bodies, we get to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you in response. So we do that this evening, Lord God. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for all you have done.
tonight. We've been worshiping so freely all week. If you want to come forward, if you want to get out of your chairs, now is your moment. Please take this time. We're going to sing it together once again. That's it, Fee. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healer. The blood is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. continue our worship now. Just lift your eyes to the screen. Freedom. 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 What, what does, does it mean? mean? His arms stretched out wide, holding the weight of our failures and pride. His cross, my freedom. It's not just a theme for the sake of religion. Love won through his sacrifice and resurrection. His cross, my freedom. Real freedom is not the absence of limits, but the presence of love, truth, and grace. His cross, my freedom. Freedom from sin, from fear, from death, from guilt and shame. Jesus said, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. His cross, my freedom. His cross, my freedom. His cross, my freedom. His cross, my freedom. Your cross, our freedom. Your cross, it's my freedom. Your stripes, my healing. All praise, King Jesus. Glory to God. He 
he's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps, there's a God who believes. Oh, praise the one who would reach for
Just reminded that um, in the story of that Passover 2,000 years ago that they were celebrating, there were some uh, people who came and they had a great question or statement actually. They said, we want to see Jesus. They said, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. And, uh, and two of Jesus' friends, Philip and Andrew, you might remember the story, uh, took them to to meet Jesus, to see Jesus. I believe that one of the things that the Holy Spirit is doing this evening is uh, drawing us into fresh revelations of who Jesus is. Whether you're somebody who's familiar uh, with the Lord, but is just longing to draw closer and to see Jesus in more of his glory, in more of his fullness, in more of his beauty and majesty and strength and companionship. Or whether actually you're, you're a stranger to Jesus, you find yourself in the building and you're not sure, and you're not, not, not quite sure what's going on, I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is at work if that's you. And the Holy Spirit's job is to take us to Jesus. And actually in turn, Jesus takes us to the Father in this beautiful way and we find ourselves in that place of being loved. Loved into a greater freedom and wholeness because of Jesus. That's why we put the cross in the middle. It's all about him. Lord, thank you that it is your fierce desire that we see you and that we know you and that we encounter you more and more. And Holy Spirit, we say more of the, 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 the peeling away of the, the veils that we, that we impose on ourselves or that get in the way from seeing you in more of who you are. We say continue that, Holy Spirit. Take us closer and closer to Jesus. So we're just going to be quiet for a minute. I'm going to encourage you to stay standing if that's okay, because this is all that part of our worship. I'm about to lead us in communion, which will take us part of our worship together. You might even want to say that prayer that the, the Greek said. Lord, I want to see Jesus. You're calling us by name with a passion beyond words and we're so grateful. We are so grateful that each one of us here is the object of your affection and kindness. For each one of us here you went to that cross. For each one of us here the Father raised you and you sent your spirit to be with us. Jesus, thank you for the cross. And so we gladly take these gifts. We want to take them in a worshipful way, Lord, in a, in a, in a, in a manner that is worthy. Always give you permission to examine us, Lord, to show us where we might be approaching you casually, or just in an over-familiar way, or just with stuff attached to us that you died for. bread of life yourself took bread blessed it gave thanks and broke it gave it and said take and eat this is 
my body. And it's broken for you. It's broken for you. And you bless the cup of wine, you give thanks, offered it. This is my blood, you said. Let this wine be my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. So do this in remembrance of me. With thanks in our hearts, Lord, with that desire to see you more nearly, we receive these gifts in the faith that you will continue your work in us. Thank you that we're the clay, you're the master potter. Carry on, Lord, carry on your work in us. Raise faith and obedience and love and help us to look more like Jesus. Bless us even now, Holy Spirit, as we receive and as we worship you. So we continue in our worship. Receive bread and wine if you want to. Uh, there'll be a station here at the front, at the back, some upstairs. Those who are serving, just come.
Because of the cross where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.
Yes, you do, Jesus. You deserve it all. You deserve everything that we've got. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. That that seems like, and you know, almost not enough. But we thank you for all that you have done, for all that we are celebrating today, for all that you have overcome. That the cross is victorious. That you overcame death. That you are alive. That you are alive. And we can stand. We can live. We can be today. Free, fully, fully free. No guilt, no shame, no darkness because you overcame all of that, Jesus. And you still overcome, overcome, overcome. And you, you do it today in partnership with us. We are so grateful. We are so thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for the fresh revelations that are happening across the room this evening, where you're meeting us and you're you're giving us a, a new perspective. You're bringing the story to life once again, that it's not just a story, but that it's true, that it's real, that it's for today, that it's for forever. There's eternal value in what you did. <laughs> We thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that you're here now. in the room that there are those still of us who feel we're far off. Maybe you've known a closeness, but you feel far off. Maybe you've never known a closeness. The, the Lord is calling us, and he, he won't leave anybody, anybody out. The Holy Spirit is here. He's not in the business of leaving people out, those who want to connect with him in a way. If you're, if you're up for this and you, and you don't mind, you might just want to pray with the person next to you if you know them or just put a hand on her shoulder. So he, just, just say over them, he, he, he's not leaving you out. You're not left out. The Lord loves you. You are not left out. Some of us are feeling unworthy. We're, 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 really, me? Could, 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 he, could he love me? Does he want me? Does he know me? Yeah, he does. And he, he, none of us are worthy, but that, that's not the qualification. The, the, the cross right here is our qualification. It's the blood of Jesus is our qualification. That's the qualification. He did that to open the way. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And I'm praying and declaring over us, no one left out tonight. No one left out. peaceful, worshipful, joyful space. Um, uh, and that doesn't end, of course. We're, we're about to have the, the worship of the word, which is great. Um, yeah, and again, so welcome to those who have joined us. Just a pleasure to welcome you into this place. Just going to say something about baptisms, and then Anna is going to pray for my favorite speaker, who's going to come and speak uh, this evening. Uh, but so just to say, there's, there's no real notices and stuff. If you want to know what's going on in the life of the church, hop on the website. Everything's there. But just to say, in a fortnight's time, we will be opening up this little swimming pool here behind me and, and mirroring something of, of Jesus on, on the cross in the sense of a dying and a rising, which is part of what baptism is. 
Um, if you're somebody who's a follower of Jesus and you've not been baptized, or potentially you were baptized uh, as, a, as, a, as a baby and you want to own that for yourself, we could have a discussion about that. There's only one baptism, but we, we happily celebrate the baptism of those who, uh, in that situation. Um, please come and have a word with, with me or, or Hills or somebody on the team, and um, we'd love to organize that. That's a couple of weeks' time, so don't delay. We'd love to know. Thanks, Anna. Great. Hills, would you like to come on up? We're going to pray for Hills. She's going to um, speak to us this evening as we open God's word. Maybe place a hand on your heart as well. Pray for yourselves to, to be open to what the Lord might want to say to you. So yeah, Father God, thank you that you are already here. You're already moving. You're already speaking. And we just pray for Hills um, right now in this moment for what she's about to share. Lord God, thank you for her heart after you for the preparation that's gone into this evening. And we pray that she herself would be attentive to your voice this evening. That she would speak your word, that she'd be a channel of you tonight. And we pray for our own hearts and our own ears to be attentive and to be open to what you might have to say this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Anna. Am I on? Do I need to do... Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. So, happy Easter from me. Happy Easter. Easter. Have you had a good day? Just to notice that I think there are still some eggs left in that basket. So, on your way out, nobody's watching. It's the time to stuff your pockets because they've all got to go by the end of today. Uh, Isn't it wonderful to be celebrating together in here this evening and in here this morning today the single uh, event that separates the Christian faith from every other worldview in history? Our leader is not dead. Our teacher, yeah, our teacher is not in the grave anymore. Our God walked out of that tomb alive. And actually, everything that happened on the cross was validated and proved, as it were, because of the resurrection. I don't know about you, but um, when I sort of, as I was a teenager and um, I I believed that Jesus died on the cross. I didn't really understand. I mean, I'm not sure that I understand everything. There's a lot of mystery in it. But I believe that he died for me. I believe that he died on the cross. Uh, But when I discovered, when I was at university, that the resurrection was a physical event, that it really happened, that he really came back to life, that there were eyewitness events, tons of them recorded in the Bible and more, that he really rose again physically in a new body, it changed everything for me. It changed everything for me. It changed my perspective because suddenly I realized, well, one day I'm going to rise again if I believe in Jesus, if I follow him. There's going to be life for me after death. Actually, um, I've seen that. Some of you know my father died about um, two months ago at the beginning of this year. And he made his peace with God the night before he died. And as I drove back from Gloucester Royal the day he died, January the 6th, I just found myself rejoicing because the resurrection has changed everything for him. His eternal destiny changed in the moment that he embraced Jesus as his saviour. It was the resurrection. Uh, For me, it also was uh, was so impactful to recognise, gosh, this physical resurrection, it means that there is no power on earth that the power of heaven cannot contend with and defeat. If Jesus can defeat, if God can defeat the power of death, then he can defeat every other power that comes against me. It also meant for me suddenly that the truth that, wow, he promised he was going to rise again and he did rise again. It kind of helped me to see all the promises that he made in the Bible in a completely different light. Because it was like, well, if you could fulfill that promise, you can fulfill all the other ones. Friends, there's no situation that he can't turn around because of what happened in the tomb. There's nothing he can't redeem. There's no power he can't overcome. There's no circumstances he can't use to fulfill his plans and purposes for you. And there is no prison from which he cannot uh, rescue us from. The grave is the ultimate prison, isn't it? You know, and he's, he's, he set, Jesus set, well, God set himself, God set Jesus free. Jesus kind of released himself. He can do that for us. The phrase that we've had um, as a backdrop to this week is your cross our freedom. You've seen, have you seen the banner outside? It's fantastic. Declaring to the town, your cross, Jesus, our freedom. And it's the phrase that's come from that song that we sung tonight. And I know it doesn't make for a really good song lyric, but actually I'd love to sing your cross and resurrection, our freedom, because <laughs> they're connected. Because as I said, if Jesus didn't leave the grave alive, then everything that happened on the cross was a fail. Anyway, I love singing the line of that song, as I know we do. And I love the the word freedom. Who doesn't love the word freedom? 
And don't you just love Jesus' manifesto as he burst onto the scene, his ministry? He said in Luke 4, I've come. This was the first thing he announced on the public stage. I've come to proclaim that cra- captives will be released, that the blind will see, and that the oppressed will be set free. I mean, who doesn't love that? Isn't it fantastic? Who doesn't love the idea and promise of freedom? It's why it's called the good news. I don't know what you think about when you think of the word freedom. What comes to mind? What do you think about when you hear that word? It's such a powerful word, isn't it? Revolutions have been started because of freedom. Wars have been fought in the name of freedom. Political campaigns are often waged about freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of choice, freedom of movement, freedom to work where we want to work, freedom to live where we want to live, freedom to express ourselves. Freedom is a powerful word. It's a powerful concept. I wonder how free you are feeling this evening. One of my uh, most memorable moments, my kind of early tastes of real freedom was that moment that I passed my driving test. And if you remember that moment, when you, for those of you that have learned to drive, I can remember the joy and the sense of freedom and being able to rip off the number plates and knowing this means I can leave school when I want, I can go where I want to go, I, can, I don't have to be dependent on my parents, I don't have to be dependent on public transport anymore. There was such a sense of freedom for me. And it was a bit of a foretaste of when I was going to leave home. I was accountable to know when I could just go where I wanted and do what I wanted. I hope you know this, friends. But we live in a nation where we enjoy a phenomenal number of freedoms. I hope you thank God for this regularly. Actually, just being able to gather in a church together and worship freely is a privilege that many, many Christians across the world don't enjoy. We have many freedoms in this country. And yet, you don't need me to tell you. We don't need to look very far, do we, in our town, in our towns, in our cities, in our streets, to find people that aren't living in freedom. Yes, we might be enjoying our, our national and cultural freedoms, but people who, you know, we, we, we can find people who have the freedom to write what they want on social media, and yet they're trapped still by bitterness. People who are able to uh, go where they like, do what they like, eat what they like, and yet they're trapped in shame. People who are trapped in guilt, people who are trapped in regret, people who can't break free from the chains of harmful habits, people who are crippled by insecurity, people who are um, consumed by anxiety, people who can't get out of the clutches of lust or greed or by jealousy or by the need to be approved of or by the fear of man, whatever. Actually, I don't have to look much farther than my own heart to find areas where I know I'm not living in freedom. So this evening, as we think about freedom, we're going to ask the question, how do I, how do we make sure that we are living as fully as we are able in this freedom that Jesus has won for us, that Jesus has paid the highest price for, that we're singing about this evening? It's one thing to sing, you'll cross our freedom, isn't it? It's another thing to actually live in the fullness of that freedom. So I want you to, if you've got a Bible, turn in your Bible to John chapter 8. I'm just going to read a few verses where Jesus is talking about freedom. Uh, the words will come up on the screen, but if you've got a Bible, um, always good to open it. And uh, it's always good when we're talking about something to make sure that we're on the same page as Jesus. <laughs> if he's talking about it, we're talking about it. Good to make sure that we're on the same page. So John 8, uh, verses 31 to 33, they'll come up on the screen. And the text says this, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching... You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Such a familiar verse for many of us. They answered him, this is the Jews, but we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we will be set free? So right here, at the beginning of this conversation, we have a clash of understandings about what real freedom is. Notice from verse 31 that Jesus is talking to people who believed in him. And they're saying to him, he's saying to them, follow my teaching, follow me, listen to me, and you will know what true freedom is. And they're going, how can you tell us that we'll be free? We're not, we're not slaves of anyone, we're not prisoners, we're already free. They're defining freedom differently. There was a well-known 20th century uh, historian and uh, political philosopher called Isaiah Berlin. 
And he described the dominant Western concept of freedom, so that the kind of concept of freedom that would underpin what we understand to be freedom in the UK, in the US, whatever else in the West, as this, as being a freedom from external uh, interference on my choices. So in other words, nobody telling me what to do, Nobody telling me where to go, nobody telling me uh, stuff that would interfere, or nobody actually interfering with my plans and my desires. So that's why I felt free when I could get in the car and go where I liked, and not be, have to ask my parents' permission, and I could do what I liked, and I could do it when I liked. So according to this definition of freedom, anything that interferes with my choices, or my desire to do what I want, makes me feel, or actually has the effect, on trapping me or controlling me. So that's why your freedom might feel restricted if you can't play golf on Saturday because your girlfriend wants to spend time with you. It's why your freedom might feel restricted if your bo boss won't let you do things the way you want to do them or express yourself the way you want to express yourself. It's why I don't feel free uh, when I'm driving in London, I have to pay a ULEZ charge and drive at 20 miles an hour everywhere, even in the middle of the night. I, you know, I want to shout at everybody. According to Jesus... This perspective on freedom is hugely limited. It's the perspective, isn't it, that these Jews are responding with. They're going, well, we're not, we're not, we've, we've not been slaves to anyone. We're not slaves to anyone. There's nobody interfering with our choices, telling us what to do, stopping us expressing ourselves, whatever. We've not been slaves of anyone. They're thinking about freedom in those terms. But Jesus is describing it differently. This is my paraphrase <laughs> of what he says in verse uh, 32. Sorry, guys, but actually, I know an awful lot more about freedom than you do. I made you. I actually made you. Have you read Psalm 139 recently? I know about you. I know how you work. I wrote the manual on you. And you can be free from all of those kind of external factors, all of those external things that the world can throw at you, oppressive political regimes, uh, challenging costly relationship commitments. You can be free to do what you want financially because your bank balance is so big. You can be free from all kinds of external things, oppressive traffic systems even, and yet not be truly free. By the way, it's not that he doesn't care about our external circumstances, you know, the challenges of life that we find ourselves in. It's just that Jesus is saying they are not the biggest challenge to our freedom. What is? The inside stuff. The stuff inside you and the stuff inside me. That's the stuff that is the greatest challenge to our freedom, to your freedom. The stuff that keeps me awake at night. The stuff that I want to hide that nobody else, that I don't want anyone else to see. Or the stuff that actually hides me. The stuff that stops me from following Jesus with what he's calling me to do. The next step he wants me to take because something's holding me back. The stuff that drives me to the fridge or to the internet or to the other kind of compulsions and behaviours that we end up regretting. The kind of stuff that keeps me attached to my past and I just can't move away from it. The stuff that terrifies me about the future and stops me moving into it. The stuff that stops God flowing freely through me. The stuff that stops me loving God with all my heart. The stuff that stops me loving my neighbour as myself. That's the stuff that Jesus is talking about. Verse 36, a couple of verses on, if you've got your Bible open, he says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. We saw that on the screen. He's talking about a deeper kind of freedom than the world talks about. The kind of freedom, in fact, that is still intact when you're holed up in a prison cell or when your body stops working or you're in a relationship that you know you've been called to stay in but is very restrictive or when your job feels like it's hemming, in you, it hemming you in so much that you're not flourishing. He's talking about the kind of freedom that outside realities cannot interfere with. Is that the kind of freedom, friends, that we're living with and living in at the moment? Look at verse 34. He says this, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. 
quick word on that word sin. Personally, I think we can be a bit too quick to define sin as being kind of external uh, behaviours or things that we do. You know, I fiddled my tax return, I lied on my tax return, uh, so, and I, so therefore I, you know, I sinned because I stole money from the government and I told a fib, I told a lie. But what Jesus is describing here what the Bible, the word, the, the Greek word that is used for sin here, Jesus is describing something bigger than that, than just an external action. Quick, uh, very small example. I'm in a coffee shop with somebody, and the Holy Spirit's tapping me on the shoulder because Jesus wants to bless the person that I'm with that morning through me. So the Holy Spirit whispers to me, buy that person a coffee. And in that moment, I think about the fact that um, finances are a bit tight this week. Not sure if I'm going to have enough money to do the things I want, to pay the bills I, I need to pay and everything else. So actually, in that moment, I decide not to buy that person a coffee. So Jesus isn't able to bless them through me in the way that he wanted to in that moment and told me about. And so I don't. Hey, nobody got hurt. What's the big deal? Nobody got hurt. Nobody got injured. Nobody got wounded. Nobody even saw, apart from Jesus, who sees everything. But the Bible describes that as sin, falling short of God's mark for me in any moment. In, God, in that moment, the Holy Spirit's desire for me was to step out in trust, trusting that he would provide for me, trusting that he's got me, he loves me, he's good to me, so that in that moment, because he's tapped me on the shoulder, I can bless somebody else. So the Bible describes sin as just falling short of the mark, of God's mark for us. That's the true meaning of the word sin. And Jesus is saying, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave to those internal desires that go, do it your way. <laughs> do it your way. Rely on your strength. Rely on your knowledge. Restri rely on what you know. Rely on how you've done it before. Rely on what other people have told you. Rely on the way other, you know, it's always, you've always lived, whatever it is. Rely on you. Don't rely on on God. But Jesus is saying that's not where true freedom lies. True freedom lies in him, the opposite. Now, of course, we've been singing. We know Jesus has intervened. That's what the cross is all about. That's what the resurrection is all about. He died to defeat the power of that internal drive inside me to do things my way. That's what we're celebrating. I am free if I've given my life to Jesus. You are free from the power of that internal orientation to doing things your way. Free from the punishment. I mean, it's what we're celebrating, isn't it? Free from the punishment of, of doing life without God. Free from the eternal consequences of the power of sin. Free from the need to make it up for God. We never have to make it up to God for what we've got wrong. I mean, that is, isn't that unbelievably liberating? We never have to prove ourselves to him. There's nothing we can do to change the way he feels about us. He loves us as much now as he ever will. He loves, the Bible says he loves us as much as he loves Jesus. We're free from the need to even impress God. And by the way, we're celebrating this you know, event today, the cross and resurrection, I know we do every Sunday, as Tim said, which was an event in history that changed the course of the universe. But for me, the most defining thing about Jesus on the cross or his resurrection is the demonstration and the revelation of God's heart for us. It's God's heart for us on display as Jesus allowed himself, as he chose with all his freedom, I can, I can command 20,000 legions of angels to come and rescue me. He chose the cross. He chose to surrender to those nails, to the flogging, to death in that way. He chose to give up his freedom so that we could know freedom. It's, it's his heart for us, God's heart for us, God's heart for you on display. But although we remember uh, and celebrate this event, and we are free. There's a, there's a, there's a whole pile of truth in that. I think me, most of us would acknowledge, but we're not walking in the fullness of the freedom that has been won for us. There's kind of a gap between the event, the truth of what happened, and the reality of it in our lives. So my question <clears throat> this evening, really, for all of us, is what can we be doing 
to make sure that we're moving, we're continually moving into a more full, a greater experience of this freedom that Jesus has won for us. So we're moving out of being released from the fear of rejection or you know, the guilt of the past or, or the, the, whatever it is, you know, fill in the blank. How do we move into a greater experience of this freedom? Well, for me, it hinges on the answer to one really simple question. Who is driving the car of your life? You know, who is in the driver's seat? Who's driving? I mean, you know, let me remind you of the three options. Firstly, it's you, and Jesus isn't even in the car. You know, if you don't, if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't begun a relationship with him, you're driving the car of your life. And you're saying, it's my car, they're my keys, and I will drive it the way I want. And we get that choice. I'm not going to talk to you, don't want to listen to you. You know, I'm in charge. The second option, which is probably much more... Um, of a reality for many of us in here is that Jesus is in the car but I'm still in the driving seat or I get into the driving seat a lot of the time. (laughs) Kind of tap Jesus on the shoulder and go, well, look, I'll drive now. (laughs) I'll drive for this bit. I'll keep control of this area. I'll keep control of this relationship. I'll keep control over the options on my future uh, job or my work or whatever. I'll hold on to this grudge because actually I don't want to let it go. I'll enjoy the pleasure that I get from this habit. So, you know, we're not going there about that. I'll continue to protect myself in acting in this way or not engaging in this relationship. I know, God, you want full surrender. I know you want to drive, Jesus. But actually, I quite like driving, but I love the fact that you're in the car with me. That's option two. Option three is letting Jesus drive. It's letting him have the steering wheel. It's letting him sit in the driving seat. The one who paid for our freedom. The one who knows what it is for us to be truly free. Paul uh, an apostle who lived after Jesus had died, but Jesus revealed himself to Paul uh, in an extraordinary encounter. Paul wrote a book uh, called Galatians um, a few years after Jesus died. And uh, it's, it's a fantastic, if you've never read Galatians, read it, because it's a treatise really on freedom. And uh, he begins chapter five with a statement uh, that if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. But then he um, goes on to talk about, sorry, no, it was for freedom that Jesus set us free. But then in verse 13, he goes on to talk about freedom and he says this, you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. So you've got this freedom if you've invited Jesus to live in, to, to, into your car, but don't Essentially what he's saying is don't keep driving. (laughs) Don't use your freedom to serve uh, your sinful nature. Instead, use it to serve one another in love. Well, I can only love you, actually. I can only put somebody else first if I'm not enslaved, as it were, being driven, being controlled by my own desires, my own needs, my own wants. You know, I can only put your wants first. I can only put my kids' wants first. I can only truly put my, you know, whoever Jesus sticks in front of me, the person in the coffee shop, I can only put what Jesus wants to do in that moment first if I'm not, if I'm free from my own needs, my own fears, my own whatever in that moment. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 16, so I say, so this is his answer to don't use your freedom to gratify your sinful desires. He says this, verse 16, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing, if the Holy Spirit is guiding your life, then you won't be doing what your old nature craves. And the NIV says it like this, so I say, walk by the Spirit. In other words, let Jesus drive. That's what Paul's really saying. What does it look like to let Jesus drive? What does it look like to to walk by the Spirit, to let him guide our lives? Essentially, it means giving in to his perspective and his power. It means giving in to his perspective and his power. It's back to what Jesus said in John 31, if you hold to my teaching, if you pay attention to what I say, if you listen to what I say, and if you follow me, you'll be free. Giving in to his perspective and his power. Letting the Holy Spirit guide us 
in each circumstance is giving in to God's perspective in that circumstance and his power. And it's doing that through each day, through each choice we have, pursuing God's perspective and relying on God's power so that I do things his way, not my way. Do you remember uh, years ago, they, uh, there was this whole thing, uh, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And people used to wear bracelets with WWJD on. And uh, I think, you know, it had some benefits to it and it was quite a good way of reminding, you know, those who wore the bracelets, well, what would Jesus do in this situation? You know, an opportunity to direct hearts and attention to the Holy Spirit. What would you do in this moment? So one of the reasons we read the Bible, I hope you know this, friends, is not to get a tick you know, from God, to get into God's good books. Oh, I've read my Bible today. I feel better. God will be pleased with me. It's to find out what God's perspective is. How can we walk in the spirit, giving in to God's perspective in the different situations, the different scenarios, the different battles we find ourselves in, if we don't know what God's perspective is? We get into the Bible to find out what God's perspective is. You can't know his perspective. You can't know his perspective on you. You can't know his perspective on himself. You can't know his perspective on the kingdom. You can't know his perspective on eternity if you don't read your Bible. That's why we read it, to know his perspective. It's part of walking in the Spirit. And allowing Jesus to drive involves giving in to his perspective. It's where I find out when I open my Bible that I'm loved. It's where you find out that you're loved. And it's where you find out that his love for you never changes. It's where you find out that you're forgiven and that Jesus doesn't even remember your sins. It's where you find out that you're seen, that you're known. It's where you find out that you're a masterpiece. It's where you find out that he's got plans and purposes for you. It's where you find out that he can use every situation in your life to work his purposes out for you if he's driving. It's where you find out that you're a new creation. It's where you find out that you've got a whole pile of new desires from the presence of his spirit in you. It's where you find out that you're a child and that you've got this incredible inheritance. It's where you find out that you've got this new power at work in you that in enables you to live a supernatural life. It's where it enables you to, to, to have confidence that heaven is listening to you every time you pray. It's where you find out that if you hold on forgiveness, you're going to lose a whole pile of your freedom. I went to Ethiopia a few years ago to um, speak at a women's conference for a load of women. And uh, one of the team there who um, became a bit, she was a really fun woman from, um, uh, from Zimbabwe called Elizabeth. Uh, she'd had a horrific scenario. Her husband had walked out on her and her three children when her kids were small. And then her husband's family had blamed her for everything. And uh, living in the part of Africa where she lived, she kind of you know, became poor overnight uh, in having to look after her family. Anyway, she ended up in hospital at a point in time uh, in a coma. And uh, the doctors had tried everything, couldn't, uh, couldn't do anything for her. And in her coma, Jesus appeared to her. She loved the Lord. She was following him. You know, she was in that kind of, you know, sometimes she was driving the car, sometimes Jesus was driving the car. Anyway, in the coma, Jesus appeared to her. And he said to her, you need to let go of your unforgiveness against your husband and his family. And if you let go of your unforgiveness against him and his family, I will be able to heal you. And in her coma, I mean, it's extraordinary what can happen spiritually when we're in, you know, the most strange places. But in her coma, she gave her bitterness and her offence about everything that had been done to her by her husband and her husband's family. She gave it to Jesus. The next morning, and I kid you not, she told me this story herself, she walked out of hospital. God's perspective and God's power bringing freedom into her life. Letting Jesus drive, letting the Spirit lead is having his perspective on my circumstances, his perspective on myself, his perspective on the people around me, his perspective on my future. It's having his perspective and then relying on his power. Friends, do you know and do you expect to see the power of God at work in your life? 
and in the lives of those around you. I've had the privilege of praying with all kinds of people over the years and I've seen God set people free from trauma, from bitterness, from um, acute uh, guilt and addictions. I've seen people set free from addictions, from paralyzing fear, from all kinds of things because he is a God who brings freedom and there are times in our lives where we need someone to come alongside us to pray in faith with God's power. And that's particularly true if we've got stuck in certain places, if we've got generational stuff that needs breaking over us or if we've you know, had uh, involvement at different times in our lives in the occult. And then I've been on the receiving end of God's power at certain times in my life, setting me free overnight from crippling fear. You know, I wish I had time to tell you the story. Crippling fear, other times from a crushing, oppressive heaviness and anxiety. God moves in power in ways that we don't see, but we see the fruit and in, in, in immediate ways. Do you have an expectation of seeing God's power in your life? You will if you have God's perspective. Because where do we get our expectation from? We get it from his perspective. God's perspective, God's power enables us to walk in the spirit. And where do we get his perspective from? From reading the Bible, reading the stories in the Bible. Friends, as believers, we have a choice. We have a choice. Who's going to drive the car? Which realm are we going to live in? The realm of God's perspective and God's power or my perspective or the world's perspective and human power. We get a choice. Who's going to drive the car? Jesus, via Paul, in these Galatians where he says, so I say to you, walk by the Spirit. He's encouraging the believers who are reading to make the right choice. Why? Because the single biggest influence on our level of freedom that we experience is who's driving the car, which feels so countercultural. I hate it. Well, I don't hate it. I don't like him driving at times. I don't like being a passenger. I like being behind the steering wheel because I want to go this way and he drives this way. And I want to go at this speed and he drives at this speed or whatever. You know, most of us like driving, you know, and even if we don't like driving our physical cars, we like to be in charge. We like to be in control. We like to be the one who decides, you know, what happens, which way, whatever. Letting Jesus drive is counterintuitive in one sense because it involves a lot of letting go. Letting go of my way and saying, your way. Letting go of my perspective and saying, okay, I'll see it your way. Letting go of my method of approaching this scenario and going, okay, what's your way? Letting go of my mindset on this scenario or this person or my future and going, okay, what's yours? So actually, it's a daily thing to live in this freedom thing. It's not an overnight thing. Yes, there are momentary breakthroughs, but it's a daily thing, isn't it? It's a journey of moving into more and more of that freedom that Jesus has won for us. Jesus says, take up your cross daily. That's basically like saying, let me drive daily. (laughs) And if you're anything like me, Wednesday he might be driving, Thursday I've taken the wheel again. So Friday I need to make sure again that I'm saying to him, okay Jesus, I've taken the wheel back, you drive. But friends, when he drives, when he's really in charge of the car, when he's really in charge of my life, I know many of you know this. The adventure is better. The adventure is better. The fruit is bigger. And the level of freedom that we get to experience and actually we then get to release into the lives of those around us is so, so much greater. So a question for you this Easter Sunday. Who's driving? Should we stand? So if you're uh, visiting this evening or you're joining us for the first time, uh, this is just to say that um, we will be returning to worship, but we love to create a bit of space for God to continue to move in the way that he wants to, um, but through prayer in particular, uh, praying for each other, inviting him to come and move in our hearts. So that's what we're going to do in the next couple of moments. So you might want to close your eyes, 
might find that a bit easier to shut out uh, the distractions, fix your eyes on our beautiful Saviour, who came that we might experience freedom. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for your love for us that is most visible when we look at the cross. We thank you, Jesus, that it was your love for us that drove you to the cross. Thank you that in your love you laid down your life. You literally gave up your freedom in order that we might know freedom in order that we might be able to live in freedom, trusting you to lead us into that freedom and to keep us in that freedom. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that if the sun sets us free, we are free indeed. And we want to experience more of that freedom. We want that freedom, Jesus, to be more of a reality in our own hearts and our own lives. So Holy Spirit, the minister of freedom, would you come? Would you come to us again now? Would you fall on us afresh? Would you move amongst us again? Would you breathe on us? Breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Breathe on us. Breathe your life over us again in this moment. And as you, as we stand here, as you, as you stand before your God, you might just want to breathe in. Literally, you just might want to breathe in his grace and breathe in his love. Just fill your lungs. Fill your lungs with his life with his love for you again this evening. We thank you for your presence here. Breathe on us. Thank you, Lord, that you're all about leading us into life. You're all about leading us into life, Lord. And we pray that you would release more of that life to us now in these moments, in the way that you know that we need it, in the way that you want to. You might want to ask the Holy Spirit in this moment, what is holding me back? Show me what's holding me back. What is preventing me from following you more freely? Some of you I think that might be an experience that the Lord needs to put his finger on and it's, it's an experience that you're struggling to move on from. And actually the Lord wants to release you from that this evening. I just believe that the Lord, he's here. The spirit of the Lord is here. And he wants to release us into greater freedom this evening. And that will look like different things 
for different people. And uh, I, in a few moments, I know he's going to release us into, <laughs> into praise again. But if you know that the Lord is just, you know, his hand is on you, he's been speaking to you, and, he know, and there's something that you're needing to, to give to him, to let go of in order for him to release you into greater freedom, or there's something you're needing to invite him into, an area of your life where you just... You, you know that you're not finding the breakthrough. You're not experiencing the breakthrough that you've either been praying for or you're longing for. If that's you, I want to encourage you to come down to the front where we can pray for you, where um, a brother or sister can lay a hand on your shoulder and pray uh, the Spirit of God, the power of God into your life. If that's you, I want to encourage you to make your way down to the front. I think there might be some of us in here, and you know that this evening... Jesus is just inviting you to move over and let him drive again. You know that you've been in the driving seat and actually you just know that in this moment he's saying to you, will you give me back the steering wheel? And if that's you, I want to encourage you to come and do that at the front. Sometimes it's really significant that we make a physical statement uh, to back up the the spiritual thing that's, that's going on inside us. If we could have some people begin to make their way to the front and to pray for um, the people down here. If we could have women praying with women and, and men praying with men. and you've got pain in your body we'd love to pray for you one of the things that God sets us free from or that we've seen him set us free from is pain so if you've got pain in your body we'd love to pray for you and um, if that's you could you please tell the person that comes to pray for you because they need to pray specifically for um, yeah for whatever it is that you're needing release from Jesus, queer and a yen and a machine and a yen and a machine and a yen and a queer and a yen and a machine and a queer and a yen and a queer and a yen and a machine. Jesus, if you're here this evening and you've never invited Jesus into the car of your life, um, and you are just here this evening and thinking, actually, I'd like to get to know this Jesus, I'd like him to be involved in my life I'd, I'd like to invite him into the car of my life if that's you I'd love to encourage you to come down to the, the front on, on the right your right hand side my left hand side and uh, somebody will pray with you to do that with you we don't want to create that pressure, but the, the Lord has been you know, knocking away at, the, um, at, at you and your life. And you, you don't understand everything, but you understand it enough to know that life Jesus way. He is who he says he is. He died the death that he did to release you into the freedom. And he needs to, to, to take the wheel of your life. If that's you, then so want to encourage you. You'd say, Tim, I don't want to leave this building until I know that that's happened for all the stuff I don't know I want to know that that's happened and that he's in the seat so do come just make your way down here there'll be one or two to, to greet you also another uh, picture somebody's had is of uh, us carrying a small bag um, but with, with a few things in it um, and it, it's like they're not the essential things or at least Jesus wants t- us to be carrying the essential things and we're carrying inessential things and they're a weight when we carry a load of inessential things, it's a weight and it slows us down. It's not necessary. He, when he sent out the, his followers, he said, he said, don't take too much. Take some essential things. And so there's some things that we just need to do a bit of an exchange. If that speaks to you, just need to do a bit of an exchange. Just come and, and, and seek the Lord for that. 
Um, I also believe that uh, the Lord wants to release us from uh, some harmful, uh, I think he'll describe them as harmful habits. Um, we might call them addictions or, or whatever, but harmful habits, stuff that you know is trapped, uh, where you're trapped. And uh, in, in, in all your best efforts, you don't get free. That's because all our best efforts never get us free. Uh, but the Holy Spirit's efforts get us free. And so if you've uh, got, you don't even need to say what it is. This isn't like, you know, God tell somebody, but you, you know that you're trapped in a, in a habitual cycle of something that has got a, an enslaving effect on you. Come for release tonight. More of you, Jesus. More of you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your perspective, your perspective and your power. Thank you, Jesus. I just wonder if there's somebody here and actually what you feel is trapped in hopelessness. Um, if that's you, I, I, I think the Lord is going to release you from that this evening. So if, if that's something that resonates for you, you just feel like you're trapped in hopelessness. That would be a word that resonates for you. Come and let somebody pray for you. Just believe that there are more, more people carrying physical pain uh, in your body. I would so love to see more of the power of the Lord at work in those ways just come. It might be that you, uh, you, you're close to somebody who's got pain in their body, a physical condition. Um, just love to see more of the healing of the Lord. Can, could you come? Appreciate we're always taking a little bit of a risk when we step forward, things like this, but I, I want to say gently that sometimes we take a risk by not. a rescue song the band are going to lead us in Again, I just think the Lord is still wanting to rescue us from stuff fear is such a crippling thing such a big thing the kind of fear that really impedes us in our, in our walk in life let alone with the Lord if you're somebody who you just know that the weight of fear is, is, a, 
it is a real drag. We'd love to pray for you. And I'm going to include within uh, the, this uh, weight to the um, the weight of offence. Kind of treading sensitively here, but you know that you carry offence as a a thing, a weight. And the idea of releasing that offence, releasing that grudge, bitterness, whatever you want to call it, um, it feels like a bit of a comfort blanket. You don't want to release it because it's so painful. Um, freedom lies that way, though, friends. Freedom lies that way.
Lord, let us walk in freedom right now. Let us know what it means to be a child of God. Lord, help us be bold. If we're not understanding that, if we're not feeling that, Lord, don't let us leave this place unsatisfied tonight. Help us be curious. Show us what it is to walk in freedom, Lord, to let you drive. Family 
Friday. <clears throat> Astonishing Sunday. And on from there, Lord, we say. And on from there. As much as, you know, we might want to continue and last one out the building, turn out the lights. But I want to pray that, uh, that blessing of, of a line that, that really struck me. That love flows through our veins. The blood that flowed through Jesus' veins and that was spilt on the cross for us. And then in his gloriously resurrected body has poured out all of the benefits of that blood. Means that love can flow in our veins too. I love us to bless one another for his love to flow through our veins. And I don't believe that that means it's, it, everything looks dramatic in our lives. It means that we do all the little things with love. We work out of that place of love. We allow his love to flow through us, through his spirit, and that, that our perspectives and our, our, our lives, our words, our actions that are shaped by that love. So Lord, would you bless us with more of your, your love flowing in our veins. Put a hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. Bless them with that. So be filled with the Holy Spirit of God again. Be filled. We need to be filled. Or we say, would you fill us again? Would you fill us, Holy Spirit? Fill us. Fill us with yourself, which is to fill us with your love. Your kind of a love, a strong love, a fierce love, an encouraging love, not come some kind of Hollywood wishy-washy thing. But that kind of a love that makes a difference in the world. But as we carry your presence in our very being. Lord, would you communicate that, that, that love that the world is so desperate for without knowing it through your people, your church, this church. We are so grateful, Lord. Fill us afresh now from head to foot, from tip to toe. Fill us, Holy Spirit, fill us. And would, would the love of Jesus, the love of the Father, the love of the Spirit flow in our veins and take its effect, not just on a, a wonderful Sunday night in this building, but on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and on and on. Bring glory to your name, Jesus. Bring glory to your name, King Jesus, through your body. All God's people say, Amen, Amen. I'm not telling you to go. Feel free to stay if you want. Um, I'm going to say that these guys behind me have worked very hard <laughs> and uh, could probably do with a bit of a, a rest at times. So go, go with great blessing. Thank you for being with us.